Guys, we're with my friend Cameron Hopkins. Cameron is the owner of Superville Ammunition. We're in his private gun vault here, and he's showing off a piece that I've heard about a lot, and this is the first time I'm seeing a completed one. Well, you know, the reason that we're talking about this stuff, Cam, is people know we've introduced you before, you own Superville. So my idea with Carry Trainer is we believe, even though you, every one of these products, there's somebody behind it. Some yes. of them are good people, some of them not so good people. We like you. We've, we've, been, we've been working with you a while, so. I appreciate when people can can understand who's making the stuff that yes. they're that they're using, and you can see you're not just some dude that sees dollar signs to sell ammo. You are a gun dude. Oh, I am a passionate gun mm -hmm. dude. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I started as editor of American Handgunner in 1984. 17 years there, saw the internet come in, and uh, luckily I didn't have to deal with a lot of that when. Mm -hmm. I, uh, print was king back in the 80s and 90s. Now print is dying. But, yeah. Uh, at the time, I, I know that you hate hearing yeah, that. It hurts. <laughs> it hurts to say it. Yeah. I hate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, so I've always loved firearms and shooting. I shot my first deer when I was 11 years old. Okay. Sitting on my stepfather's knee. Oh wow. With um, what did I shoot him with? I think a 30-30. Okay. Good old fashioned lever action. <laughs> Good old fashioned lever action. Love that. Love that blaster. And but then everything from that since then has mostly been handguns. Okay. So I like handgun shooting more than rifles or shotguns. I'm not a very good shotgun shooter. Um, handguns are my passion. I started shooting in Ipsic in the early 80s. Okay. Uh, before American Handgunner. That's how I got the job at American Handgunner was based on my Ipsic competition experience. Wow. Writing freelance stories about okay. competition shooting. Okay, okay. So they thought, here's a guy that can get us in there and give us the scoop. Yes, on this hot new combat shooting mm -hmm, game. Mm -hmm. And now you went from there on to other things. I know you've also done work with SWAT Magazine. I've done freelance writing for SWAT, for the NRA, for sports afield for peterson's hunting okay but most of my work was at american handgunner okay i started another magazine called combat tactics when i went to work for surefire okay so my career is basically american handgunner 17 years then surefire for about 12 years and now superbell and the hush puppy project it's cool so this is this the is the function. part that Supervel is designed and is patented, as well as the machine work to the slide of this gun. Yes. So we cut a notch in the slide right there, and then install the slide lock device, which replaces the thumb safety. So this pistol comes either with the thumb safety or without. So we get the one with, and then just change the part out, and machine the notch in the slide, and you got a lock breech gun. So you would fire push that lever down, cycle, extract the spent casing, a new one would go in, and then you could lock it again and do the same thing. Yes, Yeah. exactly. Super yeah. cool. And now this is, you're going to re release this at shop this year. People yes. will be able to see it and test it and yeah. play with it. Well, on the hook, so why is Supervel involved with making lock breech firearms? Mm -hmm. The hook is that in 1967, the SEALs fielded the original Hush Puppy pistol, mm -hmm. which was a Smith & Wesson Model 39. And it too, it did not use a little locking device, it used the slide stop lever. So the original 39 used the slide stop lever, which came up in the front and pivoted. And would lock. And that so would lock. push it side. down and it would lock yes, in. Yes, correct. Okay. Super cool. And the well, seals would use that because that coupled with the suppressor made it even quieter. Yes. Yeah, so the, well, a gun makes three sounds when you pull the trigger. So there's the sound of the gunshot mm -hmm. and you need a suppressor to minimize the sound of the gunshot. Second, you have the projectile, and when it goes through the air, above the speed of sound, it creates a sonic crack. So you use subsonic ammunition, mm -hmm. and that was the hook. Supervel loaded the original subsonic 9mm for the SEALs back in 67. The third sound is the sound of the slide reciprocating. And then you get a little bit of sound coming out of the chamber. So as the slide opens, you get a little noise. You get a little noise coming out of the chamber. So by locking the slide shut, you eliminate the metallic sound of the mm -hmm. slide cycling. You also eliminate what's been called chamber pop, a little mm -hmm. bit of noise coming out of the chamber. The suppressor has to be a wipe style. So this is a um, baffle style suppressor. This is not it's not efficient enough to make eliminating the sound of the slide worthwhile. I see. Um, we've tested that, and the only way, 
So in other words, if the gunshot is louder than the slide cycling, there's no need to silence the slide. Right, right, right. So you have to have the gunshot quieter than the sound of the slide cycling. Which is pretty ridiculous if you think about that. So with that ammo, with the wipe style suppressor, it's quieter than the sound of the Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. So the we'll have two different models at SHOT Show, um, both wipe style. One is a hybrid, so it'll have some baffles in it. Okay. And then a wipe section on the end. And How the many other shots one, can you get out of there before you have to do any kind of That's work? the problem. So these things are only good for 10 to 15 shots. Okay. That's why the original SEAL pistol was issued with two sets of wipes. Okay. You, ca you got your suppressor, an extra set of wipes. Okay. A, it was modified to take a Browning High Power magazine, which oh. holds 13 rounds. Okay. So you got exactly 26 rounds of Supervel subsonic. That's cool. Did they load that with ball ammo? Yes, 124 grain ball. Okay. I've got some of the original ammo. I pulled a bullet and weighed it. A lot of people have said it was a 158 grain bullet. That's not, not true. It was, it was 124 a 124 grain jacketed hollow, or ja uh, uh, just a jacketed uh, yes. full metal jacket. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. I can't wait to actually see the finished product with that wipe suppressor on it when you're all done with it me too i haven't seen it <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a little bitty thing so people will be able to buy the complete package yes right you've got an exclusive distributor you may or may not want to talk about that now but you'll be able to go buy the entire package and then go to yes. Superbell and get the so we have a partnership with lipsies okay which is a distributor in uh, baton rouge louisiana mm -hmm. so the average consumer can't buy a gun from lipsies mm -hmm. you have to buy lipsies sells to dealers the dealer will sell to the gotcha. the end user, the customer. So somebody go to their local gun store and say, I need this gun. Lipsy's is the Lipsy's is, is the, the sole source. Okay. We don't even sell them. Mm -hmm. So everything goes through Lipsy's. Makes sense. Um, they will have both the, the suppressors and the pistols. Um, the original pistols will come just factory stock. So the first generation are just factory, the way they come from Smith & Wesson and mm -hmm. from Glock. Next, we'll introduce a an upgraded version, so more like, you know, these customized uh, trigger jobs mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. slide work and frame stippling, yeah, and yeah, suppressor height sights and maybe an RMR, yeah, all sorts of different options will be available in. You might call it a custom grade gun. Sure, sure. And for you guys that have seen the frog sticker and have asked, what's with the frog? Yes, that's the tie-in, right? Yeah, well, we have to do a cutaway to Freddy the Frog. Sure. Or Frankie the Frog, sorry. Freddy was the so, original one. Freddy was the original. Yeah. So the SEALs came out of the UDT, which was the underwater demolition team. That's circa World War II. The SEALs didn't stand up until Vietnam. So the original UDT, their mascot, was Frankie the Frog, who was this muscular little frog character with a sailor hat on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He had a cigar in his teeth. And he was running, carrying a stick of dynamite. Because <laughs> they Cause went underwater and blew stuff they up. They went underwater right? and blew, yeah, yeah. blew stuff up. Blow bridge abutments up and all that stuff, yeah. Yes. That's so cool. we took Frankie the, uh, pardon me, Freddy the Frog and made Frankie the Frog. Which is that still masculine frog yes. with, the, with the sailor hat. And on. he's got a cigar, mm -hmm. but now he's carrying, the he's running with a suppressed hush puppy pistol Rather instead than a of, of a stick of dynamite. Funny. Which is super cool. There's a lot of history there. Well, and my ultimate goal, of course, would be for the SEALs to buy the new version. Sure. Um, they probably won't buy the Smith & Wesson. They'll probably buy the Glock. Um, Which would be the smart choice. Well, the reason we did the Smith was... <laughs> I'm just kidding. A hundred percent for the tradition and for the legacy. Sure. Well, and they also had the safety. And they have the safety, mm -hmm. which was an easier solution than the mm -hmm. Glock. Mm -hmm. The Glock was quite a head-scratcher, but... Um, Got it worked out. Th the method has worked out very well. Very yes. cool. So before we came up with our own suppressor, we looked around at some others. So oh, that is a wipe style suppressor. See that in there? That's a Gemtech Aurora. So it's solid. Okay. It's literally yeah. punching, the bullet's punching, a, twirl it around? punching a hole through a solid mass. Not solid, but through the wafers, right? Uh, so that, okay. as a wipe style, will do what this, not, will even do a better job than this longer battle oh, style compressor. Yes, yes. The caveat, though, is you get a dozen shots out of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
hey, for like a dedicated home defense gun or something, where you didn't want to have your ears well, go now out? there's an interesting question. Whether or not you want a suppressor on a home defense gun. I wouldn't want to blow my ears out. I would want the neighbors calling the police going, mm. there's a gunfight going on <laughs> that's, next that's door. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Although, I think that's all depends. Like, do you live where there are neighbors? Well, having worked at Surefire and having been there when they stood up their suppressor division mm -hmm. and kind of drinking all the Kool-Aid about mm -hmm. why you need suppressors because it blows out your hearing mm -hmm. so you can commu communicate with your teammates. Sure. Um, there's a lot of nice reasons for having a suppressor. But then I talked to this guy from Fifth Group who was in the SIF. Mm -hmm. well, our Z's from the SIF group. Nothing yeah. but door kicking. That's yeah. all they did is mm -hmm. kick doors. So people don't realize not everybody in special forces is a door kicker. Sure. So you have Some intel linguists, guys. Yeah, you have med medical stuff. Yes, you have comm guys, but mm -hmm. the door kickers. So this guy was a door kicker. That's all he did for six tours. And so I told him, oh, I guess I guess you used a suppressor, right? And he goes, no, I hate suppressors. Hmm. I go, why not? He said, because I want those to know there's shock and awe coming. I'm going to throw grenades. That. I'm going to be shooting. Yeah. I want just a massive wall of sound coming in when I come in. There are guys that would climb up to take out like rooftop sentries all would use suppressed guns and he would not because he was the breacher going through the door. Yes. Same thing. Boom, boom, boom. Flash. Yeah, they want as much yeah. noise as possible. Yeah. Shock yeah. and awe. If you're awe. dumping a flashbang, you don't need to worry about a suppressor for sure. Tell us about some of the stuff that you have in here. Why do you, why do you say own that Thompson? What made you buy that one? Well, I mean, the, the firearms are such a fascinating uh, item. I mean, I, the, and we could talk for hours about all the stuff in here. We could go on and on and on and on. But um, the Thompson, I really like World War II. Okay. So I've made quite a study of World War II, and the weapons that were used in World War II are of great interest because they influenced the courses of the battle, which in turn influenced the course of the war. Mm -hmm. So, and it was also, I mean, what makes World War II so fascinating, it was the last great land war of massed armies. Mm -hmm. We'll never have that again. I mean, today everything is surgical, everything is air power. Mm -hmm. That was probably the single biggest thing that came out of World War II was the dominance of air power. Mm -hmm. Navies are no longer even relevant. Sure. I mean, we found that out after Pearl Harbor. Sure, sure. One plane that can sink an entire battleship. Right, right. So, um, anyway, I'm fascinated with World War II. So, I have Garands, I have M1 carbines, I have uh, BARs, uh, Browning 50s, just a lot of the guns that were used in World War II. Um, I'm an avid big game hunter. Yeah, I, so you, I have a lot of that. Uh, hunting rifles. Everybody's got their favorite. My favorite is Winchester. Yeah, I like the Model, Model 70. 70 huh? um, Mausers are very cool as well because they're sort of the the forerunner of the Model 70. So there's a few Mausers in there, but they're mostly all Model 70s. Carlos Hathcock did his work with a 70, didn't he? Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Carlos was and, uh, one of the most widely acclaimed snipers of vietnam right even of all time yes yeah, yeah. like 92 96 something like that wow. i mean with phenomenal like a, number of confirmed with a pretty kills. basic winchester yes you have a bolt action winchester and an unertal scope U unertal i think that's how you pronounce I'm not, it I'm not the one with the big spring on it you know? okay the okay weird looking thing okay yeah it's amazing you know you have these um, super complicated not even complicated, but complex and, and sophisticated pieces of equipment that guys have now. And he was doing it with yes. basic optics. With no range finder. Yeah. You, know, you have to use your crosshairs to uh, serve as a range finder. So uh, what do we have here? I don't want you to have to go into great depth, but you've got a serious collection of what looks to be a lot of similar actions, right? Well, these are all, for the most, there's a couple of Mausers in there, but they're mostly all Winchester Model 70s that have been customized by... Um, well, some of the top gunsmiths out there. Most of them are Sterling Davenport, okay. a gunsmith out of Tucson that I got to be really good friends with, and I really like his workmanship. I see There's a couple some, of David Mag Miller Magnum rifles. actions in there. So this is the. This is a pair of David Miller rifles. He was the guy back in the '80s into the '90s. He's somewhat not quite the dominant custom rifle maker he used to be, but. Um, 
he's still one of the best that ever was. And so, does it ever bother you to spend the the money? to have a gun like this built so beautifully and then go throw it in a bag and take it off into the bush somewhere? Oh, no, no? absolutely. No? I mean, uh, those have all got scratches and dings okay. and wear marks. Um, some of them, the bluing is worn up by the muzzles um, from where I've been carrying it over my shoulder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, another type of gun I really love because if you love to hunt, the ultimate hunting is dangerous game mm -hmm. because... There's risk involved. Sure. It's not just you shooting Bambi standing out in the field. It's Mr. Grizzly Bear or Mr. Cape Buffalo. Yeah, who you've, can, got, you've got some Cape Buffaloes under your belt, some lions. A couple of elephants. A couple of elephants. So these are, the double rifle was developed as the ultimate dangerous game rifle. And the reason is that you cannot have a malfunction. If a charge is coming, that gun better go bang. What are these chambered in? Um, this is a 475 number two, uh, 500 Nitro Express, wow. 470 Nitro Express, and another 470 with an extra set of barrels in nine. That's three. 500s like this, isn't it? That's a great big thing. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. get one out in a minute. But um, so the only way you can assure that your gun's going to go bang is basically to have two guns. Okay. So you have two barrels, two firing pins, two, two hammers, okay. two triggers. So if you go click in the first barrel, you just move your finger move to the second trigger the and, pull and you've away. got another shot. Unlike a bolt action rifle where if you go click, you have to do something. You have to manually work the I got gotcha. the action. So it could be a bad cartridge. So that's uh, still a lot of faith in a single round doing the job on one of these big animals. Right? Yeah, that's usually all you get is yeah. one shot. That's awesome. So and like this gun was made in 1919. Oh, wow. And I took it on a safari in 2009 on its 90th birthday. Wow. I had the camp cook bake a little birthday cake for it. What with, a testament to the quality of the, the build well, itself. Guess what? Next year is 2019. Wow. So I really ought to take it on a hunt for its 100th birthday. What are you going to do? What are you gonna, where are you going to go with it? Well, I haven't, I haven't booked it yet, but <laughs> I need to do that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it only gets 100-year birthday. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've featured um, my World War II 1911s on Instagram, mm -hmm. and people are enamored with them. They think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. They love the history. I always try to work in a little history lesson. Like, yeah. You know, there were four different manufacturers of 1911s. I read that one. World War Two and actually five if you want to count the super rare bird, the Singer. Okay. Sewing machine company. How many did they make? Exactly five hundred. That's it. That's it. Okay. So there one were, of those goes for a pretty penny. Oh God. Yeah. The world record is four hundred and fourteen thousand. For one of those. For one. Wow. And it would have been in mint condition. It was sold by Rock Island Auction. Can I grab one of those? Sure, yeah, grab any one. So of them. let's see this one. I'm not going to even bother clearing it. I'm just going to keep it in a safe direction. So this one here is a Colt. Colt made the third most pistols during. So of the five manufacturers, by far and away the smallest was Singer with only 500 guns. Next was Union Switch and Signal. Union they made 55,000. Let's come this way a little bit. Which is not, which sounds like a lot, but out of 2 million it's not so many. What year was this one made, give or take? Uh, might have to look it up. This is this is World War II, though. That is so World War II. We're talking 70, 80-year-old pistol, 80-year-old pistol. The finish is pretty well worn, but I bet she still shoots by. Yeah, so that one is, you know, would not be a very valuable gun. That would be just a working this, example, this a typical. One somebody was out shooting. But it using. may actually be more cool than one in mint condition. Because that gun was issued. Somebody carried that. Whereas you pick up another one that's like in perfect shape like that one. Yeah, this is another Colt. And this is, so this has not been refurbished. No, those are all original. You see that, Drew? I mean, this looks like it just came out of the box from Colt yesterday. I mean, there's a little bit of, of wear marks on it, but it's not... This is probably... Is this thing ever even been fired, Cameron? Maybe not. I mean, it doesn't look like it. The barrel hood doesn't have any wear marks on it. Yeah. So there's a lot of little things look you look for. Look at the grip there, to... Drew. It looks like... i am put it in the light. That is called Bakelite. It was an early form of hard plastic. And this is an 80-year-old gun that looks... Like it's been wrapped in cosmoline or 
sitting somewhere well preserved all these years. Just to segue over this, yeah. some of the coolest guns out of World War II are, those, are German guns that come with some what's known as capture papers. So if you're a GI and you either killed or captured a German, and well, he's got a pistol. He's got a Browning High Power. Well, I, well, I want to take that Browning High Power home. So you take the dead German or the captured German's pistol and you, you keep it. Okay. Well, when it's time for you to actually muster out and go home, you have to have authorization to take that gun with you. So this is no, these are informally known as capture papers. But this is the document that allowed... Robert Felver? Look, yeah, looks like Technical Sergeant Robert Felver was allowed to bring home one Belgian Browning High Power. That's super cool. Can I? Sure, and look at the date on yeah, it. Yeah, so se September 19th, 1945. I certify I personally examined the items of the captured enemy equipment in the possession of Tech 5 Robert L. Felver, and the bearer is officially authorized by the theater commander under the provisions of section blah, 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 to retain as his personal property the articles listed in paragraph three below. That's pretty cool. And, then and it's here it is. It's a tangent sided high power. So then this has a stamp on here from a captain. Very cool. So when the Germans invaded Belgium, they took over FN. The original high capacity nine right the, there. The, the fantastic Belgian made high power. That's beautiful. But they took it over and they go, oh, that's ours now. You're going to start making guns for us. Yeah. So it has the Waffen Amped, which is the Nazi Eagle proof mark. That's very cool. Provenance, right? Provenance? Provenance, yes. So there's a lot more than just having a modern tool like this one here that's beautifully built. You can collect something. Like, tell me about this old Colt. Is that a 1900? Well, John Browning didn't... Some people think the 1911 just descended from heaven. Yeah. The, the angels were singing, and a cloud comes down and presents this world's sure. most finest handgun ever made to John Browning. No. It was fits and starts. Mm -hmm. and so he had a couple of guns that he started with prior to the 1911. So this is a 1902. 1902? And 38 rimless smokeless, Ooh. which is basically the 380 auto, a longer version of 380 auto. So it has some recognizable browning characteristics, but there's no grip safety. Mm -hmm. Which, from what I'm told, there's he no never magazine. Want, he never wanted that, did he? The grip safety. No, the, the army mandated that. Okay. There's no mag release. It had a heel mounted okay. mag European release. Okay. style. Um, this would be the slide stop. And there's no safety. No thumb safety. So, how would that gun have been carried? Well, that's a very good question. Um, you couldn't carry it cocked and locked. I suppose you'd carry it, what, condition one? So you would hammer thumb, down thumb on a loaded cock, chamber or, it. or hammer down on a um, uh, empty chamber. Rack it and go to town? Yes. So the 1902 gave rise to the 1905. Look at the finish on so the Has that been refinished? Yes. Okay. This gun would be worth, oh, six figures. Wow. If that was the original finish. If it had not been... Okay. Because, in addition, serial number 75. Wow! So that gun would be worth a lot if it had been uh, in original condition. Even so, re, uh, refinished like this and with that serial number, it's still, I think I traded $6,500 roughly on this. That's very so this cool. is in 45 ACP. So this was his first 45 pistol. But note the grip angle. I mean, it's like 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. If you just pick it up, like, close my eyes like I'm a 1911 shooter, mm -hmm. that's how it points. Sure. So when the Army got hold of it and it evolved into the 1911, they changed the grip angle and added the grip safety, added the thumb safety, added the mag release up here instead of on the heel. So, so really that gun came about because of so many... 
of the Army's requirements, yeah. which, just to make sure everybody understands, that high power that, that uh, Cam just showed was kind of the ultimate culmination of Browning's pistol work, right? It was finished after Browning's death. His so son? he started it, and a guy named, oh, geez, um, he's a Belgian. Okay. It was a Dewey Don Suave. Mm. S U A V E, I think. Dewey Don Suave. Dewey Don. Finished up what okay. John Browning started. Okay. The uh, high power, incidentally, was the most sought after pistol in World War II because it held 13 rounds. Sure, sure. Almost, twi <laughs> almost twice the capacity of the. I mean, they, the they liked high cap guns back then just like we do today. Right. What about this little guy? The little pocket Colt. Um, this is a vest 1905. So again, Mr. Browning was uh, one incredible uh, inventor. So this he called the vest pocket because back then men all wore vests. And so you had your pocket watch in one pocket and you'd have your little 25 ACP in the other pocket. And just like a lot of other John Browning's inventions, he invented the cartridge. Hmm. So he so invented the, the 25 ACP and then the gun. So just like he invented the 45 and then the gun. I think that's an interesting thing that you bring up. A lot of folks that are younger don't realize that like the 25 or the 45 or the 9 are all 100-year-old or older cartridges. They're not yes. they're not some newfangled thing from the 50s or 60s or 70s. These are ancient, not ancient, but yes, centennial aged uh, cartridges, which is amazing that we haven't made you see new stuff like the 5.7 and the 3.57 SIG, but still, these cartridges are still carried by militaries and law enforcement around oh, the world. Oh, yeah. They I work. mean, the 9 millimeter mm -hmm. dates back to 1908. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's still working strong. It's still working strong. We yeah. haven't come up with anything better. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> interesting until, like, lasers or something comes out. Yeah. yeah. Star, Star Wars guns. And I like weird shit. Like, this one is weird. Yeah, what is that? I was looking at that. Um, this is the, this is a Velo dog. Velo dog. So Velo is the this is a French made gun. Oui, it oui. has a folding trigger. Hmm. So you would slip it in your pocket when you needed it. You could fold down the trigger, and if you pull it, it's a double action. It will rotate the cylinder, and the hammer will fall. That's ingenious. But then you have to push it back. That recocks it. And then you get another press. Yes. What was that chambered in? Um, this is, is four millimeter. It's going to say it looks a little bigger than twenty-two. A little, a little bigger than twenty-two. So it's called a Velo dog. Velo is French for bicycle. Hmm. A dog is a dog. So, so you have so, to you shoot on your bicycle. It's made for shooting dogs <laughs> so that are chasing you while you're riding you get your bicycle. A, get away! Yes, That's exactly. <laughs> Peta would love this guy. <laughs> That's hilarious. But that's seriously the name of it. You Google it, you will find uh, Velo Dog. That's funny. So that's a cute one. That's an unusual gun. Um, this one is pretty unusual. I was looking at that. The Boberg. Mm. So the Boberg about that. has the magazine is backwards. So, pardon me. It's not backwards in the sense that the, the cartridge, the, but the, the rounds are angled the opposite way, right? Yeah, I don't have a 9 millimeter, But the, the round goes in this way, bullet forward. So it does not feed it out of the magazine forward into the chamber. It plucks it out of the magazine. Pulls it back and up. And then puts it into the... So it's a bullpup. Have you shot it? I've never shot I've read gun. about them in a magazine. It's so basically it's it's giving you a, a more of a full size barrel on an extremely short package, right? Yes. So it's a bullpup. The definition of a bullpup is the trigger is in front of the action. Didn't know that. So if you get a Steyr Aug or like the one right there. Yes. Anything that then you've heard the term bullpup. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Basically, the trigger's in front of the action. Did not know that. So the trick to this gun is because it pulls the bullet backwards or the cartridge backwards and then reinserts it in the chamber, you, it will pull, it does it so quickly, it pulls the bullet out of the case. Ah. So if the bullet is not properly crimped. Yours would be fine. Mine would be you, fine because we, a, we use a yeah. heavy crimp, but, um, but some they, have, they, they do have issues with this. 
and it's no longer in production. It was... Jeez, it only out for a year or two then. Yeah, this guy named Boberg. Yeah. Uh, Bond Arms has picked up the design and has changed a few things about it. And they made that in 45 and it 9. It points pretty nice. Interesting. Yeah, the lengths we go to to try to save a little space. How many was the capacity? I'm going to guess six, but I'm not sure. It's a single, single stack, so probably five okay. or six. Yeah, sometimes we spend a lot of time coming up with things that maybe are not solving a real problem either. Glock 43 do the same thing that that, that guy does. This I like to show people. Oh, yeah. Especially to all my my Glock fanboys. Yeah, the original plastic it's, gun right yes. there. Yes, VP70, that is 1970, 15 years before Gaston Glock ever thought about making a gun. So HK had the first polymer framed handgun. And in HK fashion, it's a big block. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things to hate about HK, but that their innovation is not one of them. That's um, um, This is a cool gun. I was just about to look at that. Original Bren, Bren 10. 10. <gasps> Does and, it, you have a magazine and, for it. I was going to say you have a magazine. It even has a magazine. I don't know if you remember, Drew, when we were filming some of the 10 millimeter stuff from Supervel, we talked about the Brand 10, and one of the reasons this thing went out of business is they could they shipped the guns with no mags. They couldn't get magazines, so people eventually said, to heck with this gun. I've actually never held one, may I? Yeah. This is Cooper's creation, pretty much, right it's here, Cooper's right? Cooper's creation. It's a blend of a CZ-75 and a 1911. It's even got the gun sight bird it's right there. It's got the gun sight, the Raven. You know? See that, Drew? I don't want to muzzle Cam. That was Gun Sight's logo right there was the Raven. Yeah, Colonel Colonel Cooper, this is the culmination of everything that he wanted in a high-capacity pistol that surpassed the forty-five. So this is a double stack? Yeah, it's a double stack. And, of course, the brand-new cartridge that came out with it. Do you ever Have millimeter. you ever fired it? Let me get rid of it. Uh, let me show you one thing on here that it's got a... This renders the gun completely inoperable. So it, you can't. Interesting. You can't, can't, you know, nothing. That's cool. So it's like a master safety. I don't know exactly what the purpose is, but it completely disables the gun. That's very interesting. We're out here in Pro Gun Cub. Las Vegas. It's actually Granite City, Nevada. And we are going to be doing some filming, high speed filming, of Supervel's all copper ammo on gel blocks. So this is the 9mm all copper projectile. This is a sub. Cool!